Welcome to episode 22 of Redesigning Cities, the Speedwell Foundation Talks at Georgia Tech. Today's episode is on redesigning streets post-pandemic. I'm your host, Ellen Dunham-Jones, a professor in the School of Architecture, where I direct the Master of Science in Urban Design. Check out our previous episodes on a wide range of topics that are, and they're all available on our website. We post videos of the event to both the Redesigning Cities and the Georgia Tech School of Architecture's YouTube channels, and we post edited podcasts to all the major podcast platforms. Now, we do want you to, um, oh shoot. <laughs> I think you guys are seeing my text. This is rather, are you see? I hope you're seeing my slides. Um, before I introduce today's okay. event, I want to encourage all of you on BlueJeans to post questions throughout the talk in the Q&A on the right side of your screen. You're welcome to use the event chat for comments and saying hi to friends, but we will only be moderating the Q&A for questions. Please like questions from others that you especially would like to see answered. Those of you watching on Instagram Live are also encouraged to post questions there. Our assistants will migrate them into the Blue Jeans Q&A. And we heartily encourage you to follow us and the speakers on social media. If you hear something you'd like to share today, please retweet it at Redesign Cities. Now, coming up next, I still want you to, I would love you to save the date for the next online Redesigning Cities talk on November 17th. We have two very distinguished guests for episode 23, Redesigning Cities with Affordable Housing. Noted sociologist, author, and journalist Andrew Ross will present work from his new book, Sun Belt Blues, The Failure of American Housing, followed by a discussion led by Shelley Patisha, former director at HUD of the Office of Sustainable Housing and Communities under President Obama and current chief climate strategist at the Natural Resources Defense Council. I expect this one to be as sobering as it is urgent. So today, we I'm really excited uh, to welcome Dr. Vikas Mehta, Tony Garcia, and Dr. Carrie Watkins to a discussion of redesigning streets post-pandemic. Lockdowns, work from home, and fears of crowded indoor space during the pandemic have shifted how many of us use streets. From streeteries on the one hand and street racing on the other to drive-by birthday, drive birthday parades and outdoor schools, our streets have become significantly more social. Will these shifts last if and when the pandemic eases? And what do they mean for public space? What advice do our speakers have for city lovers, designers, engineers, and policymakers about the future design of streets and the allocation of space for cars, transit, cyclists, and pedestrians? Carrie Watkins is uh, returning to redesigning cities to give us a civil engineer's perspective and moderate Q&A. Both a researcher and advocate for active and collective transportation, she is the Frederick Law Olmsted Associate Professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering here at Georgia Tech. She directs the T-SCORE University Transportation Center, working to define strategic visions to guide transit. Full disclosure, Carrie and I are both bike commuters to tech and very proud of it. Now, architect and urban designer Vikas Mehta will present research he's been conducting on the social use of the street during the pandemic. This builds on his book, The Street, A Quintessential Social Public Space, which won the 2014 Environmental Design Research Association's Book Award, an honor my latest book with June Williamson shares for this year. Vikas is Professor of Urbanism, Fruth Gemini Chair, and Ohio Eminent Scholar of Urban and Environmental Design at the University of Cincinnati. Tony Garcia of Tactical Urbanism fame will kick us off. 
Based in Miami, he is co-founder with Mike Lydon of the Street Plans Collaborative. In addition to co-authoring the Tactical Urbanism book series, he's co-author of the Bloomberg Asphalt Art Guide, I love that title, and the NACTO, or National Association of City Transportation Officials, Streets for Pandemic Response and Recovery. Winner of several prizes, he taught part-time at the University of Miami's Architecture School until the firm just got too busy with projects around the world, including on Atlanta's Peachtree Street. Tony, I will stop sharing my screen now and ask you to start sharing yours. Awesome, thank you, Ellen. Um, there we go. So thank you, Ellen, and, and everyone for being here. Uh, seeing my screen, okay. Uh, as Ellen said, I'm, I'm a co-founder of Street Plans. I'm an architect uh, based in Miami. I, I travel around the country doing um, you know, tactical urbanism, but really the, the core of our work uh, as, as street plans, uh, we're transportation planners. And we started our, our firm really as, as advocates and as friends in Miami, you know, a couple of decades ago and realized we had a passion for transportation only to go into the field and realize that most of the work of transportation planners and engineers just sits on a shelf somewhere. So for the first part of our career, we really were doing tactical urbanism, like the images that you're seeing on the screen, uh, just for fun, because we were interested in in getting the work out into the world. And now it's become, a, a, I think, an important part of our field. And the whole COVID experience really brought to light that that we needed tactical urbanism the whole time. And, and this was the real moment for this methodology to, to be applied to cities. So in our, our, in our work, we do everything from the technical drawings, like what you see on the right, all the way to actually going out and painting. Most of the things, any, any of the paint that you see on the street here, um, I actually went and painted myself uh, or, or some of our staff. So we do everything from the planning all the way to the execution. And the reason that, that we really started to get into tactical urbanism, as I was saying, the, this disillusionment with our profession at large. And, and I feel like for a, a group of architecture students, um, as I'm, I'm sure there, there are architecture students in the audience today, um, really thinking about how we apply our skills to the real world. I was working as an architect uh, at the time when we started our, our, our firm, not even working in transportation. Um, and one of the things that I noticed as an advocate in the community for better transportation, for better streets, better transit, was what I'm showing on the screen, that our, our project delivery process, uh, whether it's architecture, or, you know, large buildings or infrastructure, is just so overly focused on the silver bullet projects, the projects that are going to save everything. The new stadium, a new Mercedes stadium or whatever type of stadium, uh, a new streetcar is going to save downtown. Um, and thinking about that at that time and the process that, that got us there, right? That it, it's a slow process to, to get to large infrastructure projects. And really we inherit this whole public input process from the 1950s. And, and I'm showing here the construction of I-95 in downtown Miami as, as it goes through our, what was, a, our first African-American community in, in downtown Miami, destroying that neighborhood, except for the one building that had a constituency of people that could fight, and that was the Mount Zion Church. So right now, if you go down I-95 in Miami, the highway shimmies around the church because they weren't gonna demolish a church, even though they, they demolished you know X number of acres of, of neighborhood. Uh, but in response to this, we planners and transportation engineers and even architects we inherit a process that is really just about checking a box. It's not, it's not uh, flexible. It's not really results oriented. When we do a public meeting, um, and it's it's cynical to say this, but it's true, we typically are not really there. Ninety percent of of consultants are treated this way. Not there to actually listen. We're just there to check a box because we have to because of this. And we think, well, this was a bad process. The construction of the of the interstate was a bad, terrible process. But what we do now 
is performative and also a terrible process. So is there something else that we can do? And the fact is that we're still doing it. So that same uh, expressway is being rebuilt like this, what I'm showing on the screen. So no lessons have really been learned. Uh, and I say that against the backdrop of, of the conversation we're about to have with COVID streets. But as far as this type of large infrastructure, we're still battling those, those fights. And I think it's no wonder that we still have really low tr trust in government. And I've been giving this presentation for many years, and this is one of my favorite slides because it just has such staying power. And it's, it's relevant now as it was in 2008 and 2007 when we were you know, just starting this. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, this slide has not changed that much. So that, that should be sobering for folks. We're still dealing with this. And the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street in their current incarnations are still arguing about the same thing is what is government actually doing for us? How is government responding to our needs in a way that's real and transparent and flexible and addresses what we actually need, not, you know, some sort of a quote unquote signature bridge over land, which I'm, you know, not even going to go there. But I, I always say of the Bernies and the, the Trumps, really, they're, they're coming from different cultural points of view. And I, and I think that's a big part of this conversation, the red states versus the blue states. But they're really drawing on the same cynicism. Um, and in, in our field, that's manifested in these mega projects. At the same time, we really, I think, as a, gener as a, as a culture, have been trained to expect uh, changes to happen really frequently in our lives. And, and that's the software of our lives, the hardware. Um, I, I am an, what is considered probably I'm a geriatric millennial on the fence with being a very young uh, Gen Xer. So I know what it was like, how it's been this whole time, uh, but I also knew what the, the before times were before um, we were all connected. So I've been able to see this and I feel like we're all trained. We, we have our, our phones, our phones go, to, go through prototyping and testing uh, and there's multiple versions done of a device that we spend a thousand dollars on. Um, and we buy new devices every year or there's a new software update and some things break, but then other things get better. So there's an expectation that things are going to get better, that there's a progress to the iterative nature of, of our culture at large. When we do this for our devices, for, for cars go through prototyping, um, you know, all the things in, that, that we really use in our world, except for our cities. They don't go through any prototyping. We're relying on standards from MUTCD and and documents that are housed in the federal government that dictate our streets and, and our street design uh, that are stuck in the 1950s, that haven't iterated, that haven't um, caught up with what people are expecting. And at the end of all of this are we planners who love to impose lines on a map that don't really reflect what people need. And so I, I always say, let's start by being humble and not doing that. And let's listen better and if people are going to show us what path they want to take, we should you know, try to adapt to that rather than have them adapt to what we think is the right thing. And all of that boiled together over the past 10 years, 15 years, equates to tactical urbanism. That's the, the philosophical underpinning of this idea. What is tactical urbanism? Um, and so we say, and this is just a general you know, sort of definition here, uh, we say tactical urbanism projects are implemented on a much shorter timeline. So that is, could be a few days if it's a pop-up or even a year if it's something that's interim design. The budget is comparatively smaller to, in comparison to a large scale infrastructure project, even at $300,000, that's a drop in the bucket when you're talking about millions of dollars to resurface a street and, and reconstruct curb lines. Um, and the process is one that allows for individuals to get involved in, in the work that, um, in the creation of the infrastructure that they're gonna use, which is not the way that we do most infrastructure. Um, and so we like to say that there, there are these, sep these phases that people can, can uh, adapt for their projects, starting with the demonstration, which could just be a one day thing. And there are materials that correspond to each of these, of these sort of phases. And, and in each phase, you're increasing the amount of political will that you need to get to the next phase. You're increasing the amount of, of public participation in a way that's real, not just coming to a meeting on Wednesday night at a, 
you know, cafeteria somewhere. Um, and you're also increasing the quality of the materials and the cost of the materials, all the way getting to long-term capital improvements. Now that's that's the state of our practice and, and this idea of tactical urbanism pre-March of last year. But then COVID happened, right? And this is this was the common theme. On the one hand, you had um, you know, the wealthy folks who maybe work desk jobs at corporate offices now found themselves with a lot of extra time and the roads were mostly empty because nobody was was driving around. And so you had a, a, a boom of, of the use of our streets for recreation, for bicycling, for walking. You saw people walking around neighbors, you never saw them walking around before, which is great. Uh, but at the same time, you also had our transit system and our essential workers, which included con contract uh, construction folks, and janitors and, and the folks who are actually keeping the lights on in all of our facilities, having to still take transit and having to still walk and bike to work. Um, and so there's this tension there about who benefited from, from the changes in our transportation network and how we sort of equalize that. Uh, during COVID and, and still even today, we saw really the wholesale adoption of tactical urbanism as a, as a tool to get things done right away. And, and it was really the right moment for it because all of the normal protocols, public works protocols and, and standards went right out the window because necessity dictated that we needed to do something. And so at least the very initial uh, COVID responses were demonstrations. They were you know, just cones or whatever provisional thing could be sent out there. And now you're moving into more pilot and interim design. And I think that's where we're lingering here is is projects that were really meant to be in the ground for a month because staff didn't know how long this was all gonna take, now lasting for a year and a half or more, how do we take it on to the next step? I wanna talk about that in a second. In service of that, of this idea and the fact that cities around the world were, were really adopting this and around the country, we worked with Bloomberg um, to come up with this document, the NACTO guide, uh, to really try to identify the most common um, public works issues and, and concerns when it came to the use of our streets for any number of activities. And, and a lot of this is, is sort of over, is, is uh, repetitive because there, there are certain things that you need for all uses of, of the street, like fire access lane. Uh, but we were able to detail uh, and really, I think, facilitate uh, a change in, in how our public works departments were using the streets and what they thought was, was possible. I think you, you talk to folks like us and Ellen and, and, and the others on the panel, we, we always saw the opportunity in the streets, but this moment gave our engineers, I think a little bit of breathing room to question their, their previous uh, conceived notions, whether they were accurate or not, to allow them to do more innovative things with the roadway. And as it turns out, you know, what we've discovered, I think, and I, we're, I know we're gonna talk about this in a moment, um, is this uncovering of value economic value as much as as just human value in in the streets uh, you know rediscovering the street as a civic place but also as an economic generator where previously we we were using a lot of our street space just to store cars really at a loss to the city from any number of, of metrics to being a boon to the city they just rediscovered that they had you know all this space just waiting there for this opportunity this does create problems with regard to public space and private space access, which I'm gonna mention in a moment, but I think we, we did the prototype test, right? That's what this COVID experience has shown us and it's there, the opportunities are there. Now we have to figure out how we're gonna improve on what we've done and what cities have done so that people don't get left behind and, and the projects actually start to improve the public realm instead of just being temporary measures. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close it out by, by just touching on a, on a few items that I, I've been thinking about and, and in my travels, just working with different cities around the country. What are we thinking about? How do we go from this very temporary vision of what the street is now to the next thing? How do we make it last? How do we build on the things that were working and, and address the things that were not working? Because that's really central to the whole process of, of tactical urbanism is acknowledging that that the work that we do as planners and engineers and architects, we don't have all the answers and we fail probably more than we, we'd like to admit. So let's be honest about that failure, address it and fix it before we make million dollar investments. 
So here, here are just a, a couple of things to address. Um, now is the time, and it has been the time for some time, to move from the crisis response, the cones, or even the delineators, to something more permanent. And this is Miami Beach, one of my favorite projects that, that happened anywhere in the country uh, during COVID. This is Washington Avenue, their main street in Miami Beach. And Miami Beach, in this part of, of Miami Beach, south of 17th Avenue, um, over 60% of the people are walking, biking, or taking transit, which is a huge mode share for uh, for transit and, and active mobility in comparison to the rest of, of Miami or even any of the you know suburban sprawl type cities. There's a little jewel in our in our region. Uh, so they were already set up to set, succeed with this test. And what happened was they needed outdoor dining for their for their merchants, um, and they already had a really strong bike culture. So they created a a protected bike lane here by just removing one full lane of travel, which they would never have done in the before times. Um, and now there's this tension. Well, we did that. The travel speeds have not changed dramatically, um, but you've seen a, a triple digit increase in the number of people biking. Uh, but it's still not a protected bike lane fully. It's parking protected. So there are things that they can do, like add better delineation, add better uh, cross, bar, cross bike markings through intersections and improve the quality of the street rig. So you see this sort of, this is actually one of the nicer ones, but there are very makeshift looking outdoor dining. So what's the next step? And, I, and the city is, is grappling with this right now because they didn't know that this was gonna be successful. It has been, but there's still a lot of political pushback from folks who wanted to go back to the way that it was, even though that pattern is no longer relevant. The big issue, the biggest issue I see with this work um, nationally, if not internationally, is the privatization of public space. And how accessible is that public space to folks? And so here I'm showing a, a crowded cross a sidewalk. Um, and it, this is not just about the privatization of the, of the street, but who's using this, this outdoor dining? Who's allowed to use this outdoor dining? As I can tell you, with a high top condition, like what you're seeing in this photo, folks in wheelchairs can't use this dining. And I don't see a ramp down to the to the street level, so they're not able to. Folks who are who have you know mobility challenges can't get down to the street level. So a lot of things were done really fast to get something going to save the economy, but now we have to go back and and get the get the details right so that these spaces don't exclude large parts of our population and are successful in the long term. Um, and the, one of the things that I'm really grappling with is is this question of can we move forward without going back to the way things were there's a muscle memory there that i think public works agencies are going to want to go back uh but they've learned so much and this is another project for miami beach because of the success of the first project that i showed you they were able to to really just open the floodgates on a bunch of projects that had gotten caught up with review so in during COVID, they finished a whole lot of lane miles of, of protected bicycle facilities uh that they had in the works that just became relevant and they found a path forward. So now, how do they keep that going? How do you maintain this, improve upon it, and keep that process going? It's all about process. Uh, and I find that the cities that are doing the most and are, are, are most set up to succeed are those that had already started talking about this institutionalization of the process. So that a tactical urbanism isn't just about a bunch of people going out and doing some crazy things in the roadway, but it's a, it's a sanctioned thing that the city adopts. And you all have to look no further than than downtown um, where P Peachtree, basically between Baker uh, and Ellis, where the city um, did a huge project, I think a monumental change to your downtown, to your main street, uh, taking one lane in either direction and creating this, this mega mid-block mid uh, crossing with an uh, expanded uh, sidewalk area. I was going to show you a whole bunch of, of cool pictures and I thought, these guys are in Atlanta. I don't need to show them anything. They just walk down there. Um, but I think that that without the policies and the staff in place that were already trained in this, in a way, this project would have been much more difficult. And the, the meta arch of this is that, you know, this is a part of a, a planning study to envision what happens in the long term. So in the best case scenario, the use of tactical urbanism is one where we use it to prototype and test something that you're going to put real money into making that permanent. So just before this presentation, I was on a call with staff uh, to see what the next, the, the phase 1.5 of this project would be, and then what's phase two. 
So that might be painting the sidewalk extension with a mural and fixing the things that didn't work. There's some dimensional issues that need to be addressed. Uh, and then improving the things that were working. And then finally, I'm seeing, and this also goes back to that Peach Street project, um, I'm seeing an increase in the scale and durability going from the pop-ups or thinking about tactical urbanism as solely the purview of the folks who do parking day to real infrastructure. And this is a project I'm showing a rendering of a project that is going in the ground as we speak. It's being constructed right now. It's about a mile and a half of protected bike lane and physically separated bus lanes in Culver City in Los Angeles, which really in the before times, I, I wouldn't have seen that. And this is a community that has Amazon, HBO, Apple, major headquarters of corporations have located here. And so the city has made a huge investment in the street because um, they see the placemaking value for their economy. And, and I, I only see that as being, I see that as being the bigger picture for a lot of cities in taking tactical urbanism and, and running with it. And this project, I would firmly categorize it as tactical, though it's on the, on the interim design end. This project started in October of last year and paint started going in the ground last night. So it's, it's a one year project that is a major infrastructure project but that still abides by the, the philosophy of tactical urbanism. So I've said a lot. The, the final thing I'll say is that I'm, I'm really excited about this next work that, that we're doing with Bloomberg uh, to do a, um, a safety study about asphalt art. We've been in a, a multi-year uh, partnership with Bloomberg, helping cities around the country implement asphalt art projects like this one in, in Pittsburgh, in the Friendship neighborhood. Uh, and what we're constantly hearing is, well, from engineers in particular, are these safe? How safe are they? How do they impact pedestrians and crashes and speeds? And we're doing a study right now with, with Sam Schwartz Engineering and Bloomberg Associates to really get at that question, at least to start to unpack that. So that's, that's my talk. Uh, I'm gonna hand it off now. All right, thank you, Tony. Uh, that was yeah. terrific. So Vikas, please share your screen. Let's hear from you. Thank you, Alan. Um, are you able to see the screen? Yes, thanks. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the street and, and I've been um, interested in really looking at the street uh, for a long time now, but essentially started with the idea of what are the characteristics of the street, whether these are design, uh, planning, you know, everyday management characteristics that make the street a social space? And what are the kinds of things that support social behavior on the streets? Um, while doing that work in the US in several cities and also in India where I'm from, um, it essentially developed into understanding the street not only for just social behavior, but really trying to understand it as an ecology. And this is probably only one of the two slides which will have so much text, but just bear with me. The idea that the street obviously is a place for access and connectivity, as we know, uh, it's, a, it's a real site being this network for exchange of all kinds of information and ideas, but it's a real place of dialogue, debate, and contestation as well, um, along with being a place for leisure, performance, display, and economic survival, uh, as well as people to, to find refuge um, and even nature in the city. So the idea of the, this uh, construct as street as an ecology uh, rests on certain things, that it cannot be an ecology if it doesn't follow some of these very basic uh, principles. The first one being that it is to be understood as a space that has dynamic relationships that will result from sort of very interconnected activities and phenomena. And if you want the street to behave as an ecology, then you have to accept that. You have to accept that it will thrive on many activities, many different forms and objects, and also many, many different modes of control that are sometimes uh, based on negotiation and not just simple rules. Uh, and these things will operate differently in different social, cultural, and economic political sort of scenarios. And finally, not to accept it uh, as a place in equilibrium. 
meaning that the, the, you have to understand that if a street has to exist as an ecology, it will be in flux and there will be some level of conflict. And that's a healthy thing. So keeping that in mind that that's kind of a, a larger goal for street as a public space uh, to that exists in the city. That's one way to, to imagine it as an ecology. Um, now, in the context of, of COVID-19 and the pandemic, um, we've seen this very uh, sort of, you know, changing ecology around the street. With the pandemic, there was a first reaction of abandoning public space because of fear. Uh, and, and soon after, we figured that we needed to adapt um, to, to be able to get back to some sort of life. And as a result, we saw transformation uh, on our public spaces, as some of the things that Tony showed. And that transfer, transformation did two things. One, it was a contraction of public space. But on the other hand, it also provided people some agency in the ability to use public space and streets in ways that it, in fact, expanded public space uh, on the street. So very quickly, if you look at these, these are early pictures from March and April in Cincinnati, where I'm from. This is not unusual, but we found markets closed, parks generally not accessible, you know, the yellow tape everywhere, libraries closed even main streets with very few people. Um, and we, we started to see this adaptation in the tactical urbanism that uh, Tony talked about with quickly you know, trying to accommodate for some bike lanes, for some uh, seating, temporary seating on the street, um, using you know, very, very tacky, simple things like these water-filled Jersey barriers um, in trying to uh, adapt this place for some sort of uh, support for life. And, and there's a host of these things, whether these are pop-up markets or casual play or food distribution, uh, outdoor dining, um, happy hour, you know, and music on the porches. So we saw this wonderful sort of adaptation uh, on the streets as well as in other public spaces. So I'm going to talk about this in, in two different sort of uh, places in the city, if you will. The first one being the parochial or private or the neighborhood city, meaning it's the place in the city which is largely a place of the neighborhoods. And we saw an expansion there, which is obviously slightly different from the public city, from the downtowns and the extremely urban mixed neighborhoods. So here, you know, we saw this very vibrant street life, people walking and, you know, uh, even creating their front yards into social places, welcoming people while still maintaining the social distance uh, or physical distance rather that uh, became necessary. And this expansion was also seen in uh, the inner city neighborhoods, um, even though these places had very little space, but people were out and about to sort of um, be able to, to talk or be able to play on the streets. Um, especially observing children, we found that this expansion was really, really freeing for them with the lack of traffic on the streets, that the amounts of things they were able to do was phenomenal. And so in, in some ways, we redefined what uh, uh, Edward Hall called the proxemics in terms of what is our intimate and personal space. We kind of defended that uh, more than we typically do, but we also expanded what we think of social space in terms of distances. And that, that was a very interesting, or that is a very interesting phenomena playing out in many neighborhoods in the parochial or sort of the private city. But there's another transformation, which is more visible, obviously. Um, we started to see that we moved from inside to out, whether it's, you know, uh, selling vegetables, whether it's gathering together for even meetings, and in, in this case, haircuts um, on the street and the sidewalk, um, you know, doing art and kind of exhibits coming out and being on the edges of public space rather than in the museums, even being able to support some small business owners to set up little shop on a plaza here uh, in a neighborhood in Cincinnati. And we people started to claim agencies because there were very few rules uh, to be followed. So people started to, you know, take on the streets and use them in ways that were uh, actually quite refreshing to see in the ways that it ought to be. Um, and, and many of these things sort of began to 
um, show an agency that people sort of uh, started to claim in their spaces. We also started to see new possibilities. Can we use our private space, in this case, a garage as a food pantry? Uh, can we you know, supply this with converting uh, the free libraries to free food libraries? Can we use our front yards as places to play music to sort of, you know, bring at least some life to the neighborhood? Uh, and of course, down below, we can we fully take on streets to to make them as play and social spaces. Um, with all, with a whole lot of support flowing in um, uh, during the sort of sort of COVID response, this was a kind of unparalleled prospect where we have all of this change in public space with new possibilities that we are seeing and also being supported with uh, some funding. But the transformation, you know, if we try to dissect it, it's doing a lot of things in terms of streets. It's really, really making the use much more open-ended and less structured and controlled, less regulated and less standardized. Um, and trying to dissect this at the street level, we found that things were moving quite uh, quite a ways, but in many, many different ways. Certain things were becoming more public, other things were becoming less public, other things were changing the publicness, and I'll show you that as we do this um, sort of study on, on, a, on a neighborhood here. So very quick, you know, before after pictures with bike lane, um, uh, sort of two-way bike lane being installed here on one of the streets, um, the, all the, the streeteries that, you know, we've seen everywhere, uh, and even these private yards that I showed you earlier that became social places where somebody, you know, brews beer and puts it out and makes it a place for gathering. But at the same time, there's also this claiming of public space and creating these bubbles and selling or renting these bubbles for $200 of, you know, 200 square foot of space. And so there were these mixed trends where uh, spaces being sort of agencies being claimed but sometimes it is also being uh, taken away almost like a Swiss cheese that you construct these sort of privatized spaces within public space. So with that, I want to come to this. We, in, in the public city, which is really a place um, of an urban neighborhood, um, and this is the case of over the Rhine in Cincinnati. It's, um, it's an old uh, sort of 19th century uh, German um, immigrant neighborhood. It's kind of the Greenwich Village of, of Cincinnati, has a whole lot of wonderful historic architecture intact. Um, so we started to document that in great detail. And this map shows you all these different things that happened uh, during, the, during COVID and the conversion thereafter. And this ranges from streeteries to new dining areas on sidewalks, uh, places that were street closures that are meant for uh, sitting and eating out, but also for walking and biking. And we've, we've, we've documented 63 such instances uh, in the neighborhood. And that sort of leads you to, to think in terms of a total um, landscape of what changes occurred in public space, particularly on the streets. And, and very quick, these are the kinds of things that we saw in over the Rhine, which I'm sure you've seen in, in Atlanta or other cities that you're from. You know, things becoming quasi-permanent over time uh, and, you know, parking spaces being taken over, uh, some cases sidewalks being widened. Uh, but, you know, here in this case, a whole uh, length of sort of these six or seven streeteries lying the street. Um, and in this case, also some advantages for pedestrians, uh, for even for bicyclists, uh, expanding the sidewalk permanently so that there is a space for uh, sort of restaurant seating, but it's not taking away from the space that is designated for pedestrian movement. So we started to try and document this and understand it in terms of a uh, little bit like you know data. And uh, what is on, on the axis below is the mode. Um, so from left to right is, you know, left is seating, play area, other stationary activities, uh, then it's walking um, and sidewalk extension, uh, bike lanes, and then the other parts are more vehicular. The 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 axis that also shows cost is uh, zero or free to very expensive. But this is the slide that starts to explain this a little bit. 
so in in the in the light orange circles is the space that is either parking which is metered in this neighborhood everywhere or it's a vehicle lane and this is what is used to then move to either convert to biking or to to walking or to almost very low cost sort of places for coffee or you know inexpensive restaurant but also very very expensive and if you look at this we find very clearly that there is majority of the area that is taken away from the vehicle lane or the parking is actually moving towards things that are actually quite expensive um, for somebody to afford so if you compare it in a way that if you were to park your car in that uh, metered space it would cost you less than three dollars but if you were to park yourself at that streetery it could cost you sixty dollars so there's a difference in terms of that same space however it's still not that simple uh, if you look at this from left to right the more orange to becoming white the area that is in the very free, you know free to very expensive all of that is also making the street space more convivial more social you see more people you more see you see more life there and at on the other extreme you start to see it's less convivial right so it's so the the street going back to this uh, was changing to be more social as we see but this at the diagonal if you think about it the one that is at the closest of where the two axes meet is the most public it is free and it's also you don't need a bike you don't need a car you you can just be um, you know somebody on 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 foot or on a, on a wheelchair and you can occupy that space that part of the street so it becomes extremely complex when we start to look at this in terms of what public space is doing on the streets when studied in a whole neighborhood that it is becoming more social more convivial but not necessarily more public if we were to kind of intersect these two together um, so we've seen just the last few slides we've seen that the street use during covid uh, was being used for its kinetic purpose meaning you're traveling you're using bike lanes more uh, i haven't talked about it much but in this case we all know how that um, we use the street for civic protest and we used it to demand uh, justice and change in our sort of political social practices uh, it certainly was used for exchange, economic exchange and other, and very much social, particularly in, in neighborhood uh, places. The street were also used very much as a restorative space for people to walk and to jog and find this space that exists essentially for free to do a lot of their exercise and, and restorative activities. And it, it's sort of gaining this symbolic uh, role uh, of being an ecology, a place that can do many, many things together. Again, you know, we, this is not really the uh, the idea to romanticize um, the, the pandemic situation. We all wanted to kind of go back to some sort of normalcy, but there are lessons that we can, in fact, uh, think about the street and its social psychological benefits uh, that it has sort of provided us uh, during this time. And we've got to think about how this opportunity it's like a pilot like a sample has offered us to convert the street into a much more complete ecology but we have to keep in mind that we don't compromise the publicness while we convert this into a space that is much much more uh, sort of public and much more open we cannot compromise the publicness the actual ability for everybody to use the street Thank you. Thank you, Vikas and uh, and Tony. Uh, so let's, uh, Tony, why don't you turn on your video as well and let's have a conversation. So um, Vikas, why don't we, well, picking up on your thoughts, thank you both, great presentations. Um, we don't have quite as much time for questions now, but so we'll, you've, got, you've answered so many. Vikas, Tell us a little bit more, elaborate on, a little bit on what are the changes that you think we should be making to streets to make them more equitable and public? You've kind of hinted at it, but do you want to give us just a, you know, one, two, three, what, do we, what should we be doing? Wonderful. I think that's a really great question because we can be, you know, critical about 
um, observing the way the street is sort of changing. And, and the short answer to that is really in the slides that were before the permanent changes. If you look at the way that, in fact, people were claiming agency for exchange, for restoration, for the symbolic value. Uh, in other words, how were we using the streets during the pandemic? We got out there, you know, put some cones and said, we can actually meet here. We don't have to be in a room. We can use this as an outdoor social space to conduct meetings. We can uh, be here and we can sort of create small businesses, give them some opportunities to sell things. You know, we don't do this. And again, if you think about cities in South America or in Asia, none of the stuff that we are talking about is anything unusual you know this is how the street is there in many cases but we've seen this the taste of this during covid and so the the short answer to that is let's look at these pictures and there are hundreds and thousands of documentation of this in how we've used our own streets in ways that are more than just streeteries in ways than in fact the ways that are even more than just bike lanes. We were able to do so many things of sort of our daily lives on this public space. And that's the, the place the street offers us uh, these other ways to, to use it. Thank you. I, Tony, do you want to jump in on that question in terms of uh, kind of the other additional uses? I saw you nodding your head on I, some I of think that. I think because actually touched on it really well, it's the informality that occurs everywhere else in the world. And that's some for some reason, it's this American idea that we have to, like, regulate everything, which I mean, there's a there's a positive to that as well. Um, but obviously, the streeteries did not appeal to everyone. They were not for everyone. And I, and I think there was a really telling um, photo that I think was from Cincinnati. Uh, that I did not, I took out of the presentation actually, where you had a group of, of white folks sitting in a streetery, and then behind them, I'm sure you, you, you saw that, um, another group of, of black folks who were marching during the, the summer, um, the Black Lives Matter sort of protest. And that contrast was really, I think, speaks to, to what we're talking about, which is how are we using this space and now moving forward, like how do you regulate for these activities that should be informal, that are informal in many places? Um, but there, I, actually, I wanted to to veer off of that question because I, I zeroed in on this idea of agency, right? Because you said agency, I love that word, and I think that um, before you even asked the question, Ellen, about you know the what we were talking about before the the red states and the blue states and that tension of, of and that we're experiencing right now across the country, when you think about agency. That's really what people want, right? They want to be responsible for this public space in front of their street. And there's just different expectations about who's in charge. And when the government gets out of the way, then people can actually do things like use the street in whatever informal way they want. And I think that speaks to a lot of people, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or you live in, in a, a rural, rural town versus a big city. And that's something that I think people can rally behind. Well, you're, you're yeah. sort of answering, but I'm going to I'm going to pick up on that, you know, so, so yeah. Tony and and Vikas, if you have anything to add on this. I mean, what we've seen certainly um, in Atlanta is a lot of streetcar racing, people doing donut. You know, the, on the one hand, there's the quiet streets that are becoming less car and tamer and more people oriented. But there's also places that are becoming very um, more car intensive with with people just driving like mad and and all of that is there i mean how do you, what kinds of things are you seeing i'm i'm generalizing and i'm kind of merging two questions here at once but what's what what is happening with our streets and how who's taking agency in different ways so you've got the streetcar racer folks um also a social activity dangerous but uh, and illegal but a, a, a very social um, activity you've all is there also is there a difference also though between and, and then we have the tamer you know uh, streetery streets so and or the residential streets that Vikas showed 
uh, with porch parties and, and that kind of thing. Is there are there differences between kind of the red state anti-vax, anti-mask, um, the way people are using streets, and then the 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 state the more blue cities where people are more following CDC recommendations. I mean, is are you seeing Tony? You're out there kind of in the um, trenches in a lot of different places. How do you see some of these political tensions playing out in different? in the way people are using streets or is it not you just sort of said the agency is universal everybody wants agency yeah is there not yeah i think I, I think that's true that that everybody really gravitates towards doing things for themselves right for, if, if, whether that's part of the american myth or not and it's real people do like that they want to be able to do without having to ask for permission right that's normal blue state to red state the street racing, actually, I've seen it more in the cities than in rural locations where it might have always been a problem. But now in Miami Beach, because there is so much less uh, car activity and so many fewer tourists that people are doing donut holes in the middle of, of that you know street that I just showed you. And then the opponents are, are latching onto that to, to say, well, we should return back to the normal capacity of the road because we want people to come back to, to drive because of this problem, which is a, is a backwards way of thinking. But I don't think that's a red state or blue state thing. What I do see are, are bike lanes completely caught up in the culture war that we're in, 100%. So if we're talking about adding crosswalks or expanding the sidewalk, that is really easy, an easy sell. But if we're talking about taking away parking for, um, for a bike lane, so taking away parking for a streetery, go for it. That's economic generation, right? <laughs> taking away... Uh, parking for a bike lane is a non-starter. And so that's where you, it, you have to zero into the, like, the details. Or, and, and that's been going on for a long time, the whole bike lane thing. It's viewed as you know, a coastal elite thing. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, can I, I, yeah, can I add yeah. something? Sorry, so I think uh, the other thing in this is um, the, the word negotiation. And you know that goes very much with agency. So just the same way as people found that they can claim because now, you know, there's yellow tape on every place that was programmed anyway. There was nobody to program it. That let's do something that we can, you know, if we can walk in the middle of the street and get our kids to learn how to bicycle to get them out of the house or, you know, set up a little video screen to watch a film. What I also saw was people were able to negotiate without the state in there with their rules, right? I mean, the rules are essentially a means of negotiation uh, between what's possible, what is not within cultural norms. But the good thing here was that people were able to negotiate amongst themselves. And it doesn't mean that there were no conflicts. There were conflicts, but it showed us that we don't need to depend on um, the state to be putting and putting down all these rules Right. to help us negotiate right. and i think that's that's the work that uh tony you've been doing in terms of you know practical urbanism that the community has the power to to be able to right. have their own agency and then to negotiate and you know nobody should understand this as it's smooth sailing it's not certain things will not happen because they are you know there are people enough people who don't want that there and you we might think of it as a good thing but i think that there is a negotiation Negotiation should be given a chance in this case. And, and some of this is not only, it should not end at streeteries. It could mean somebody who cannot afford, you know, the, the rental space for retail should be able to use one of those parklets to sell. Right? So that's the small business that you really should totally. be thinking about as well. Totally, totally. And I, I had never, I, I, you're lighting a light bulb in my brain. I never thought, and I'm going to reinterpret what you just said. Instead of talking about public public participation and public input, it's public negotiation that yes. we're actually doing. And I, that's something that I, I, you know, I really like that phrasing of it and that characterization. Um, I'm going to think about that more. But I want to go back to, to one more thing about the red state, blue, blue state thing, which I think is the false narrative about there being that much of a difference between the two Americas. And, and actually, if you go to neighborhoods in Pittsburgh, where we're working very often right now, 
um, it's a socioeconomic problem. So when we go to do programming or do bike lanes in a neighborhood in Pittsburgh where they don't have, where it's a food desert and they don't have a grocery store, they don't have a check cashing store, they don't have basic things that they need. Right. When we come in for with an art crosswalk, it's completely irrelevant to them. Right. And that's the same conversation in rural America and in any place. And and I think that's what's getting buried is that like actually the blue places and the red places have a lot to do have have a lot more in common socioeconomically than they than they acknowledge because they don't even see each other. You know, one of the things that strikes me is actually how both of you are using data, and yet in very different ways, I think. I really, Vikas, I loved seeing your, your data and mapping and, and of the um, over the Rhine neighborhood. And Tony, you forever have always, you know, the, the tactical urbanism always, you know, counts. How, how many cars, how many pedestrians, how many cyclists before the change, how many after. And it's an, it's, it's, it always has been inc an incredibly important way. It's, a, it's the tool around which so many of those negotiations occurred. So if there's pushback right. on a project, you come in with your data to show, look, it didn't really slow people down, and yet here's, and all this many people used it, and blah, blah, blah. And yet, um, you know, I'm so I'm kind of I'm just sort of interested. Where do we go now with the role of data and negotiation and the, and the pandemic? How much has it real has the world really changed? I mean, the pandemic doesn't give. We don't have our benchmarks are different now. Um, right. Do people write those off? Is it more important to just have the community try to generate community negotiation without data? Or is that data actually still really, really important? And I'd love to hear both of you what, what you think on that. I think it's it's as relevant now as it's always been. And my answer to that, and I'll bring it back to Peachtree, um, since it's a context that most of you are very familiar with. Um, the first answer I, I've been giving in the last year is, we're not going back. There is no before times as far as data is concerned. For people in our field, we only move forward. We can't compare. Because I don't think, and I, and I might be alone, I don't think we're, we're not going to go back to that pattern. So whatever the pattern is, it's going to be different. Um, but we can start to measure from right now, which is what we've got. So for Peachtree, we've been doing, uh, we've got ongoing data counts. You might have seen out there sometime in the last few months, cameras that we're doing 24-7 um, uh, data collection in three-day increments. And we measured at the, at the week mark, at the month mark, at the three-month mark, and then the 90-day mark. And what we found was um, that actually, even though the perception is that traffic is terrible, it's actually the delays have not manifested themselves in the manner that people think. It doesn't match what their experience is because they see all the cars and they think, oh, traffic. But in fact, the actual time that it takes them to get from, from Baker to Ellis has actually dropped. And then with, with emergency response as well, the emergency, uh, the fire department was insisting that it was impacting their 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 response times when in fact they we looked at the data and that was not the case our response rate actually improved by several seconds in this at the 60 month the 60 day mark um so i think right now data is as important as ever it's the one element of the projects that i think needs to be the most engineered the most engineering you know the most um solid it can't just be you know ellen and tony going out and, and counting some some bikes a couple of hours a day. If you could do, the more professional you do the data collection, the more solid your argument is for whatever the change is. And I go back to my original statement, which was, let's be humble and acknowledge if it didn't work, I'm the first one to go and throw my, my projects under the bus. If if the project didn't work, let's talk about it and be honest, because it's okay. Um, so, yeah. Because yeah, and I think data is really important because, you know, you go to uh, any of the, you know, city agencies, they're not going to listen to narratives, although you can use narratives right. as data. That's a different thing. But I think that uh, in, in our case, I'll give you a small example. We started to when we started to map these, we said, OK, so over the Rhine is still a fairly diverse place and there are businesses that are, you know, catering to really the tourist, the outsider. Uh, businesses that are catering to the relatively middle class wealthy insider, but also to the relatively poor insider. And there, there are still businesses that exist there. 
So I, I didn't have those slides here, but we tried, we started to map where were the street rates? Why is it that the businesses that are in fact selling inexpensive, affordable food for a lot of the people, why don't they have street rates? Now, it's not that all the street trees are at restaurants that need, you know, $60 per person, but right. the, the really the, the, the most inexpensive food, those places did not have street trees. Now, we, we, we know that this is not being paid by the, the actual business owner. The majority of this is coming from funding that the states received to be able to make these wonderful, you know, EPE flooring and beautifully sort of stainless steel cabled uh, guardrails for the street trees, all wonderful. Um, so, so these are things I think where data can actually help us make the argument. All right, well, with that, I wanna bring in Carrie because she's, she's a civil engineer. She's got a lot of data. So, <laughs> um, and most of all though, Carrie, Carrie, I wanna really ask you, all right, we've been talking about all this, you know, reallocating space in the streets for all sorts of people things. What does this mean for transit? And especially, I mean, transit in the pandemic, um, Give us your thoughts. Yeah, gladly. So um, transit during the pandemic saw really substantial drops in ridership. Um, but this was not uniform across all different modes. We actually saw huge drops in things like commuter rail because a lot of those folks were teleworking. Um, we saw drops in rail ridership. So like our MARTA, rail system, but bus ridership, although it dropped, it, it actually stayed, you know, fairly high still. So we're talking a mode of transportation that critical workers had to be on and continued to be on throughout the pandemic. Um, so I feel like this actually brings up a great question for these guys where we can rope them into this part of the conversation too, because one of the things I've been advocating for is is street grabs. And I think that's true of, you know, bike and walk infrastructure like we've been talking about. But I feel like what we haven't seen a lot of is putting more transit lanes in with this extra street right away that we have. And especially in cases where, you know, buses are stuck in traffic. And if anything, we want to get those people where they're going as quick as possible so they're not sitting on that bus for as long a time as, as they might have otherwise been by giving them some sort of priority. Um, so I'm curious to hear what what uh, Vikas and Tony think about that angle, the transit angle of things too. Yeah, I, I the the last slide that I was that I shared, or the, the the second to last slide was exactly about this, which is going from the very the relatively easy lift of doing the streeteries or even the bike lanes to transit, which I think is the is the the holy grail of, of our work, right? Um, so I'm not seeing it in the same way that that I would have liked, but I think that, for example, in that in that project in Culver City they have three quarters that they're going to be doing the same thing, a lane reallocation to to buses. And I don't think it would have been possible without the the, the pandemic, you know, changing our, our tra travel patterns fundamentally. Um, and you still, you have cities like New York that are, that were already on their way doing this type of work and the pandemic has just sort of accelerated it. So you see them on on Fifth Avenue, for example, one of the premier streets in the whole world now is in in Midtown Manhattan, mostly just for buses and for some curbside lane, which in the before times would have been unthinkable. Uh, so I, I, you see some of that also happening, and and in LA, downtown LA, also expanding by uh, the bus facilities. But I don't think it's it's directly related to the pandemic. It's the pandemic plus the trends that we were already witnessing before that. Yeah, I think there's probably some overlaps here, but I, I don't see, uh, in fact, there's probably a inverse correlation with the way we think about, you know, transit and a lot of people in them. Although Carrie said something really important, if you want people to be not in transit, stuck in the bus, you want it to be moving and, you know, being efficient. I do think though that uh, with the infrastructure money, 
you know the the funding source being available has as tony said even in cincinnati you know our agency here sorta has been looking at redefining putting routes for you know 24 hours across but i don't think it's related to the pandemic they understood that the efficiency has to be improved during the pandemic but it was something that they've been working on uh, really from before and trying to really talk about it as infrastructure Ellen, did you have one more? Do you want me to move into some of the Q and A from the audience? I think going. Let's let's bring in the audience questions. Yeah. Fantastic. So there's several good ones that I I think actually there's there's many excellent ones, but there's a couple that I think in particular relate to things we've already been talking about that I'm going to highlight first. Um, one thing I think it was Tony said. Um, now I'm forgetting who said which important points, but uh, we talked about these restaurants that were, you know, using the space and that the lower end restaurants were not doing this as often, right? And this brings up some different equity points that I feel like you both kind of hit on a little bit, this idea of agency and maybe not all communities feel that same agency where they could just take over the street um, they may not feel like they could do that. And I think this also goes into, you know, acceptable uses of the street. Um, and one of the questions we got was, as we redesign our streets to be more pedestrian bike oriented, and especially after the pandemic, when we're thinking of creating greater amounts of social space and spaces, how do we address or include the houseless community? So you know, what, how do we decide? How does the community decide which of these uses are appropriate and which ones are ones we wouldn't want to see or how do we include more controversial ones? That's a good question. And I think for you all in, in Atlanta, it's, it's, it's super present, right? Because if you look on Peachtree, that was one of the big issues that, that came back over and over, especially from the residents. What are you going to do about, about the unhoused in, especially around the park and um and just in downtown and i i don't really have a great answer my 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 instinct has always been um it's not an enforcement issue it's uh how do we include folks who are unhoused in the actual maintenance of those spaces and there is a precedent for that in other countries where um you know the people who are homeless in a park are given some limited responsibilities to help maintain the park and and that's kind of something that they do, and it's okay. We don't have that experience here. Yeah, that's that's something that I, I've witnessed in other places, but um, that's that's the approach I would take. How do we start to include those people in the design and maintenance of these spaces that they live in and, and not ignore the fact that they're there? Yeah, I, I have a, uh, actually I can build on that with a local answer from Cincinnati. So this has been, this is pre-pandemic, but uh, in Over the Rhine, where, you know, there are groups that are trying to keep the space as much for the people who lived in Over the Rhine before the gentrification about a dozen years ago, um, there are groups that essentially uh, help the unhoused, you know, take care of streets, take care of parks, and they they support them with rent. So the like the community housing here owns several units and they will support them those rents for, they will first give them for free, then they'll start to make some money in the way that they maintain those spaces, that counts toward rent. And they try to sort of work them out gradually out of this. There are some success cases, some are not, but I would think that the street use of this public space that is suddenly now accelerated, you know, that we've got so many more opportunities, can in fact be what Tony was saying, using the the people that are unhoused who are in over the rhine in this case or or other places to be able to take care of those spaces you know you do need uh, oversight to be able to in fact uh, be a more active part in operating those spaces uh, that could be opportunities uh, for people to to be part of this sort of change on the streets so We've talked a lot about spaces changing, um, but 
we haven't gotten to the temporal component of this yet, and we got a couple of really great, great questions, not the long-term temporal, like, you know, Tony was talking about the process takes too long for these big projects, but the the minute-by-minute minute component. So we got some sev several good questions around this. Um, Jack asked, should we classify streets as parks that we allow motor vehicles on from time to time? Um, and then Michael Chang asked, um, I'm trying to get to it, are there examples of diurnally dynamic uses of streets? So closing lanes for pedestrian use and play before or after in between rush hours, um, either all cars or all pedestrians or all dining is probably wasteful, but can we have it all if we sort of bring time into the equation? Uh, you know, with, with regard to Michael's comment here, uh, yes, you can have it all, but but the flip side is that you need a, an, a social infrastructure to take care of these things, right? It's not going to happen by accident that the barricades get moved out of the way. So it is the case that 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 this is exactly what's happening, and I had not not heard about it in that matter. Diurnally dynamic, I like that. It's a mouthful. Um, but that's how some of the the slow streets are, and um, I, I'm not sure about the 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 streeteries tend to be more fixed but there is some flexibility if there's somebody from the community and this is one of the, the big wins i think uh that i saw with a lot of our public works departments realizing that they can lean on people from the community and that was okay for some reason before in the before times it was like you know the city has to do everything it goes back to agency again it all goes back to agency you know, who's taking care of that space and what is the maintenance plan for it when when you talk about something that's this sort of nuanced i guess um or, or not nuanced is not the right word where, you, where somebody's got to be on a schedule right uh, that requires a little bit more organization than just ask, asking jane who lives on the corner to take care of the barricades so that goes from the immediate crisis response that we were in a year ago to how do you formalize this and institutionalize it and make it a normal thing um in terms of Jack's comment, I think that's more of a of a, a really smart strategy to get better street design. And I, I whether you consider it a public space, one of the, the sneaky methods that, that we found is classifying streets as parking lots, which to we who care about public space in cities seems like anathema. But actually, when you if you classify a space as a parking lot legally, if, it be, if a street becomes a parking lot, then public works doesn't care what happens in it. And then you can design it however you want. So that does create, you know, public-private kind of issues. But we have seen that strategy be used for really cool projects um, that would never have gotten implemented otherwise. I want to yeah, jump. I think, I think I know of uh, two examples of the diurnally dynamic. Um, years ago, long before the pandemic, Mountain View, California, kind of in Silicon Valley had a struggling downtown and one of the revitalization strategies was that they said all right after 6 p.m after at least a chunk of the not all of the rush hour but a chunk of it uh restaurants were allowed to simply put up the little red velvet rope kind of bollards in parking in front and move out and it took off it's it's been extremely successful and the, but they would remove them at the, at the end of the night it wasn't that it wasn't heavy infrastructure. It was it was a light version, a uh, very light version of, of streeteries. Now in Atlanta, I know Edgewood, which has a this burgeoning bar scene and restaurant scene, the sidewalks are so narrow that here the city is kind of saying it's a public health issue. At on on weekend nights now, we can't have cars <laughs> on those streets. Um and they're I, I believe they've actually approved that now. I think that's already, that's about to start maybe this week, you know, Halloween weekend or something. Yeah, and just just another small example in San Francisco where, of course, parklets are, you know, really sort of legalized in a way, uh, the first city to do that with a parklet department and all of that. They started to talk about the fact that, look, the city has given all these streeteries, a lot of them to businesses and claimed sort of public space. What if the time that it is not being used by the restaurant 
so the mornings in case of the you know restaurants that open lunch or later and otherwise in you know the coffee shops or whatever that use it in the morning the evenings they said this should be switched and it should become open for anybody yes they will be homeless there yes you may have to clean it up but you're getting this space you're getting this amenity as a business that's the least you could do and you know just to just to remember talking to business owners and this is not only during covid but even before to get a permit for four chairs on a sidewalk would be such a pain in their backside we all know and today they're like look at this you know it's coming to us with the design with the whole thing the whole kit of parts readily done this is great so i think there's there's a lot of opportunity here in trying to make these uh, spaces that function whether it's you know diurnally or just over time in the day as as spaces that are are different and again i want to say that it doesn't mean it will be free of conflict but that is okay it is the street it is the open public space it is not you know your privatized area within a mall so it is going to be with conflict but i think that's where we can show the city play out on these public spaces So um, I think the next one that I want to do, we did talk a little bit about sort of in some countries, just it's not as regulated as in the U.S. And we got a, a question that maybe broadens this point a little bit. Um, Alessandro asked, do you, did you consider how the streetscape has changed in other countries? other than, and he put the word rich USA, but even, you know, other wealthy countries, other countries that, you know, where streetscape is not as regulated, are there lessons that we saw, particularly during COVID, that you feel like are important? You know, I mean, the most, most of the examples that I have from abroad are from the wealthy, you know, Western European countries. I mean, the, the Paris example, I think, is is pretty well known now. Where, I mean, basically they took the tactical urbanism approach and and you know applied it network wide, which is a really great case study, as we do bike lanes individually to say, look, what you're going to reach a, a a network saturation point at one at a certain level that then you see the reward of that. I think in in the future we're going to be able to study this example and it's going to yield a lot for our profession. Um, but you know you'd be surprised that those those countries at least the western european ones have a lot of uh bureaucracy just like we do they deal with the same types of things with through bloomberg we're, we're doing we're consulting with glasgow and london on their asphalt art projects and they're dealing with a lot of the same things and every, everybody thinks the grass is always greener elsewhere but um they deal with a lot of the same sort of issues yeah, I, I had a student uh, very briefly look at some of the spaces in, in one of the cities in India, and it was exactly the opposite. Because on a daily basis, pre-COVID basis, the, the street particularly functions as this overlapping, negotiated you know space of everything in one place. And they literally had to start to distance them a little bit, you know, just to, just to, be, uh, to be sort of safe. Um, mm. Things seem to be returning to normal, but there is this sense that somehow there are things that seem a little more ordered. While a lot of things still coexist, it is not mayhem, you know. And and I don't mean that in a in a negative way, but it, just out of the need for it, the opposite had to be done, where uh, things had to be sort of separated by time or by distance. Lots you know, what's of interesting. Lessons. Yeah. So, sorry, Ellen, I, I was just thinking, one of the, the big differences that we've seen just generally, not, it's not COVID related, with our work in, in the United States versus in South America, for example, there's not a strong nonprofit culture, a community nonprofit culture in places like Argentina or Chile or Mexico. So when we talk about having a, a sort of negotiated process between the, the public and 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 you know, city staff, for example, in the United States, you have a nonprofit sector that really has a big role to play, I think, in that negotiation, which is absent in other places. So that's that's not just the, the, the negotiation part, right? The public outreach part, but it's also the maintenance, the stewardship of public space 
is entirely left up to government or nobody. And that, that, that's an interesting innovation or, or something that, that we should take pride in that we have. We just, I'm not sure that we use it as we should, but interesting. Lots of, lots of great questions here. Um, I, I want to, we're going to have to kind of close up pretty shortly. Um, I thought, I'm curious, and actually really I think, Carrie, this is a question for you. One of them in the, uh, uh, in the Q&A is, is any city dealing with the scale of vehicles? So many are at a scale that has a very hard time coexisting with multimodal use of streets. Is there any way for a city to limit the size of vehicles without tearing apart community attitudes? Is anywhere edging towards smaller, slower vehicles? And I mean, I know a lot of folks who are working on sort of, you know, the, the neighborhood size vehicle. Most of our, half of our trips in the US are three miles or less. We really don't need always the big ones. Plus we have the oversized fire trucks and all the utility public stuff. I mean, car, but I don't know that there's any change. Um, Carrie, are you seeing any? Yeah. So I would say what we're seeing in this space is some recognition that we need to not call bike lanes bike lanes. And right. so here in Atlanta, we actually call them lit lanes. Um, and uh, it's this recognition that cars move really fast and take up a ton of space. Um, and that pedestrians move kind of slow and randomly. And you really need this middle ground. And this middle ground is where all of this bike infrastructure lives. But it's also where the scooters belong so that we don't have a lot of these issues between scooters and pedestrians on sidewalks. And it's also where a lot of new innovative vehicles that are being talked about, even pre-pandemic, where, where those vehicles often belong. Because we need something that is more of an urban scale when it comes to size and speed. And really building that bike infrastructure, we gotta we gotta separate that from the word bike so that we can yeah, start yeah. to create that middle ground. Totally. You know, I I have not heard of a city actually dealing with it on the front end. I mean, you guys know cities deal with responding to things, not being proactive. But so I think it's a it's a regulatory thing that we're gonna have to to battle, you know, at the level of of manufacturing, you know limiting the, the size of cars. When you talk about a red state versus a blue state issue, like that's going to be a big one, right? Pickup trucks and whatnot. But I have anecdotally just experienced in the field when we're doing our projects, a 10 foot lane was, is our standard, right? Our minimum standard feels very tight now when I'm out there painting and I feel the size of these vehicles, the standard size. So the risk I think is undoing the last 20 years of work of the new urbanists and, and others to, to get everybody to acknowledge, engineers to acknowledge, we don't need a 12 foot lane. And now we've got cars that actually need a 12 foot lane. Um, that's a risk, it's a big risk because we don't want that to, to, to be the, the consequence of, of these large vehicles. Apart from the, from the obvious safety problem, the, the oversized vehicle. I mean, some All of right. the things we are easy to see in even um, in a lot of European cities, you know, the public works vehicles are just more compact. You know, you don't get big trucks coming around to collect trash and there are really, really, really compact vehicles in Rome and Paris and lots of many places. So I think maybe that's the place to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good point. All right, last question. And I want this, just each of you, we, we've talked about a lot of things, but kind of summarizing now, what advice do you have for the next generation um, as well as the current, but you know, assuming that the pandemic does ease in some way, uh, some kind of a new normal sets in, what do you think is the most important thing we need to do now so that the future looks like what you'd like to see? So what's the most important thing? Let's just sort of close out with that. Who wants to go first? If, I, if it's okay with these guys, I'll go first because I, Ellen and I have talked about my answer to this question already. Um, I really think that the thing we need right now is a space grab. Um, we're still seeing vehicle volumes down in a lot of places. And I think if anything, cities have not been proactive enough. We might've seen some of these outside dining and such, but 
actually taking that lane right now for transit or taking that lane for bikes, um, I think it would both do away with some of the problems we've seen with things like street racing. I mean, the reason they're out there is there's too much space. Um, and, and we've over-designed so many of our roadways and we need to scale that back and, and think about the more people-centric view about how do we best use this space. And I feel like with volumes down, now is the time to do that because we've seen crashes go up because volumes are down, so people are driving faster. And despite the fact that we have lower VMT, we, we are seeing more crashes. And, and I think the answer to all of these different things is in that space grab that cities could do right now for other modes. All right. Gosh, Ellen, you, you put us on the spot. I, I wasn't expecting that question. Um, I think uh, on, the, on the student side, if we're, if we're talking specifically for your students, um, you know, going into city government was never something that, that, it's not something that I've been pushing people to do, but I think we need more architects and more folks who understand these issues to be in city government. Um, too often our projects are driven by, by engineers or folks who don't have this sensibility or political decisions are made. Um, but I, that's where I would, I would be urging folks to think about how they apply their architectural profession and their career to these issues. Uh, because you know, no, no, but there was no class for tactical urbanism when I went to architecture school. So um, I think it, it'll be for the generation that has experienced this moment to go and take leadership positions uh, moving forward to be able to then say, yeah, we can do this. We did this during pandemic. Why wouldn't we continue that experience? And what, what Carrie said, 100%. I, like before now. Vikas, <laughs> before Vikas closes us out, I wanna, I wanna rebut a little bit to Tony though and, and bring the engineer, the kudos. It's not the engineers who always make poor decisions. In fact, at Georgia Tech, we do have a tactical urbanism class and it's in civil and environmental engineering, not architecture. Okay. Okay. <laughs> very true, very true. <laughs> It's the engineers that are changing, right, Carrie? They're not the engineers from uh, the past. I, I think that you know, keeping it to the, to just to the streets. For me, this has been really wonderful to see that there is capacity in our society to take agency and to use the the street as a space for many, many more things. In fact, I think when we see the formalization of it, the adaptation turning into permanence we are seeing the limiting factors coming back again so you know largely becoming streeteries but when we see it during the adaptation there was actually a lot more going on when a lot of people were almost haphazardly making the street use it in their own way it was in fact a much richer perhaps not the best looking but much richer use of the street. So I think that's a moment that we need to capture and be able to trust that we have agency and ability to negotiate uh, and find better solutions that are you know, using the street as a more complete public space. Uh, I just wanna thank you, um, Vikas, Kerry, Tony, You've been fabulous. This is a great conversation. We could no doubt keep going, but I do have to shut us off. Um, and I want to thank our listeners. You've been listening to episode 22 of Redesigning Cities, the Speedwell Foundation Talks at Georgia Tech. I am tremendously grateful to the Speedwell Foundation and to all of you listeners um, out there. You know, see you November 17th for Redesigning Cities with affordable housing. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.